dare inizio a questo primo webinar della serie 2020. Um, solo pochissime parole, non, non perdo tempo perché vorremmo concludere tutto entro un'ora e mezza e abbiamo molti ospiti di grande rilevanza, eh, soprattutto i nostri colleghi amici cinesi che ovviamente per loro è sei ore più tardi, ma insomma è ancora un orario, un orario assolutamente accettabile. Eh, che dire, sapete tutto sul webinar, sapete tutto sugli sponsor, eh, quello che non sapete lo saprete tra poco perché si presenteranno tra loro da soli. Eh, quello che vorrei dire, prima, a parte darvi il benvenuto eh, a, questo, a, questo, a questo primo webinar, direi che due parole soltanto per parlare di sviluppo Cina e dei, di quello che, chi siamo e cosa facciamo. Immagino che molti di voi conoscano Sviluppo Cina, è un'associazione tra imprese italiane eh, destinata, creata eh, molti anni fa per, per dare eh, un, una spinta eh, alle relazioni economiche tra Italia e Cina e per, per aiutare le aziende, le aziende italiane a entrare nel mercato, a conoscere meglio e a entrare nel mercato cinese eh, per qualunque attività economica in generale. L'associazione La, non è grande ma è è dinamica, è attiva e, e, e ha due tipi di attività, direi, direi. Una di tipo passivo, ovvero di assistenza alle aziende che chiedono aiuto, che, che si rivolgono a noi per avere eh, l'aiuto per entrare nel mercato cinese con attività di qualunque tipo, joint venture, importazione, esportazione, ricerca di partner eh, e così via. Mentre l'altra parte, forse più interessante, è la parte più attiva, ovvero abbiamo dei programmi di, di promozione, programmi di, di, di soprattutto di, mh, come questo webinar, questo è il primo webinar del 2020, tra l'altro una cosa che volevo dire, questo webinar è stato programmato, ideato prima che esplodesse questa situazione eh, che purtroppo ha colpito prima la Cina, poi noi, poi tutto il resto del mondo. Eh, il fatto che ehm, nel frattempo è successo quello che è successo ha cambiato soltanto una piccola cosa che volevamo, avevamo pensato inizialmente di fare questo webinar da una sede fisica, quindi con, incontrandoci con almeno 5-10 persone intorno a un tavolo e trasmettere poi eh, tutto il, il webinar a tutto il pubblico interessato, mentre poi ovviamente abbiamo dovuto anche noi adeguarci e fare tutti, siamo tutti a casa, insomma, eh, come tutti. Quello che è cambiato, cosa è cambiato? È cambiato drammaticamente la situazione che tutti conosciamo, ma quello che ci preoccupa di più ovviamente oggi è, sono i riflussi, le ricadute economiche. Oggi come oggi dobbiamo eh, assolutamente impegnarci con tutte le nostre forze per rilanciare la nostra economia e l'economia di tutto il mondo. Quindi oggi più che mai, immagino, questo webinar è di grande importanza. Tutti abbiamo il dovere morale di invocarci le maniche, ripartire e cogliere tutte le occasioni che i mercati globali, il mercato globale ci offre. E la Cina, sappiamo tutti, non ho bisogno di ripetere quanto sia importante eh, la Cina come sbocco di mercato, come partner commerciale, come partner industriale, come, come qualunque tipo di relazione economica. E questo webinar, eh, questo seminario, questo incontro, eh, vi darà modo di capire, soprattutto nel settore dell'industria meccanica, dell'industria dell 4.0, robotica, smart manufacturing, eccetera, che opportunità ci sono, eh, quali sono qual è lo, lo stato del, del, dell'avanzamento, del progresso in Cina e quali, quali aperture ci sono tra Italia e Cina in questo settore. Non mi dilungo oltre se non quello di augurarvi un buon lavoro a tutti i nostri ospiti e a tutti i nostri partecipanti, che ringrazio per essersi uniti a noi numerosi di buon mattino oggi, e anche di chiedervi di seguirci. Direi importante, chi può ovviamente sarà molto benvenuto, chi volesse associarsi, ma non soltanto associandosi, anche soltanto seguendoci sul nostro sito che vedete in questa diapositiva e su, cercatelo anche su LinkedIn dove pubblichiamo tutti i nostri programmi, le nostre attività. Io non vorrei aggiungere altro, il moderatore di oggi, ecco, volevo ricordare soltanto brevemente, il seminario è organizzato da Sviluppo Cina, la nostra associazione, eh, in collaborazione con uno dei nostri associati importanti, Incred. Incred è una società italiana, eh, ma di proprietà 100% cinese e, e, 
i nostri partner di questo webinar quindi sono Incred e Alberto Cocuzza, a cui passo la parola nel giro entro il massimo un minuto, sarà il moderatore perché è lui che ha coordinato gli interventi soprattutto da parte, dalla parte cinese. Volevo ricordare che oltre a focalizzarsi sull'industria meccanica, questo webinar si focalizza anche su un'area geografica particolare della Cina che è la città di Ningbo. Vorrei ricordare che la città di Ningbo si trova nella regione che si chiama Zhejiang, da dove provengono oltre il 90% dei cinesi che abitano in Italia. Quindi direi che è strategica anche da questo punto di vista. Molto importante sapere questa cosa, perché qualunque cinese trovate dietro casa in Italia sappiate che viene da quella provincia, dallo Zhejiang. E non aggiungo assolutamente altro, qui trovate i miei contatti. Eh, vi invito a contattarci in qualunque momento per informazioni e richieste di assistenza e per qualunque altra informazione o input o aiuto che voleste eh, darci. Io non aggiungo altro, eh, passo la parola ad Alberto e se ci fossero domande alla fine sono molto disponibile volentieri a rispondere. Grazie e buon lavoro. Okay. Grazie, grazie Stefano. Eh, buongiorno a tutti, buongiorno a tutti, benvenuti al nostro webinar di oggi. Eh, grazie per essere qui. Chiaramente io sono appunto Cocuzza Alberto, già Stefano mi ha, mi ha presentato. Io sono il responsabile della filiale ecco, di Milano, di Incred Consulting. Com come avete sentito, ha anche una, una filiale a Nimbuo, ecco in realtà la sede, la sede centrale. Molto, molto brevemente, noi ci occupiamo di internazionalizzazione principalmente. Uh, in particolare ecco, nei campi uh, come quelli di cui parleremo oggi, quindi automazione, robotica, smart manufacturing, per le aziende italiane ecco, che desiderano avvicinarsi al mercato cinese piuttosto diciamo, a considerare opportunità di investimento in Cina e perché no anche, anche in realtà viceversa. Ecco, il, nostro, il nostro webinar di oggi ecco, avrà come temi la robotica, l'automazione, anche una breve parentesi sulla proprietà intellettuale. Ecco, volevo molto, molto, molto brevemente inserire i nostri, presentare i nostri ospiti di oggi, questo PPT. Ecco, allora avremo tre ospiti cinesi, tre ospiti cinesi, a incominciare dal dottor Sung. Il dottor Sung, ecco, apro meglio la, la, la slide. Ecco, ecco, il dottor Sung Hunjun è ricercatore capo dell'SDIC. Per chi non lo sapesse, è un grosso centro di investimenti in Cina. È stato anche professore presso l'Università di Pechino, che è una delle più prestigiose in Cina e anche a Singapore. Ed è un esperto proprio di robotica. Infatti il suo contributo sarà principalmente relativo all'automazione industriale in Cina, con alcune statistiche e con aggiornamenti in merito. Ecco, il secondo intervento sarà invece di Mr. Lin, che è vice direttore dell'ufficio di promozione investimenti del distretto di Anjou Bay che diciamo, non, può, non, non deve confondere il nome, in realtà Anjou Bay è un distretto della città di Nimbo, è uno dei distretti più importanti a livello industriale, quindi sicuramente interessanti. E Mr. Lin sarà supportato da, da Ellis per quanto riguarda l'inglese. Il terzo intervento sarà invece dell'avvocato dell Lee, uh, Lee Jiang Ke, che fa parte dello studio legale Global Law Office. Lui è un esperto, un consulente in tema di brevetti, proprietà intellettuale, cosa di cui verterà anche il suo, il suo intervento. Ecco. E, e infine eh, ci sarà un italiano, eh, l'ingegnere Beniamini. Lui è um, vicepresidente del comitato tecnico di Thesis Motion, la uh, Thesis Motion Control Limbo, che è una, una grossa ditta che si occupa di automazione e motori elettrici in Cina. Ecco, ci pareva interessante con Stefano, con i ragazzi di sviluppo cina, ecco, trovare una persona, ecco, trovare diciamo, una una persona italiana che avesse vissuto tanto tempo in Cina, infatti Alessandro ha vissuto oltre dieci anni in Cina, che potesse un po' raccontare la sua esperienza, potesse dare diciamo, il suo punto di vista, diciamo, la persona esperta di Cina. Ecco, um, io, ecco, non, qui ci sono un po' i nostri contatti, per chi avesse, diciamo, desiderio di contattarci, e comunque vi manderemo poi tutto il materiale anche alla fine, fine dell'evento. Ecco. Io ho terminato qui, molto molto brevemente, non voglio assolutamente prendere tempo o spazio ai nostri ospiti di oggi che hanno cose molto interessanti da dirci. Ecco, e and in questo momento quindi passo all'inglese perché i nostri ospiti chiaramente non capiscono l'italiano. 
Um, so now I switch to to English, so everybody everybody can understand me, and uh, and I give the word to our first speaker of today, that is uh, Mr. Sung, that will give us a speech about uh, robotics and automation situation in China in this uh, in this talk. Please, Mr. Sung. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here and share my report. And my topic is robotics in smart manufacturing in China, a general overview and opportunities, I think, for uh, Italian companies. And uh, my report has three parts. First part is a general overview of industrial robots in China. And the second part is uh, some opportunities. I uh, I suggest uh, uh, our friends to consider in, uh, to if you come to China to seek uh, cooperation and the development. The third part is a brief in introduction to my company and my fund. Okay, the first part now is the global and the China's overview of industrial uh, robotics and uh, the contents and the data are mainly from IFR. Uh, as many friends may know, International Federation of Robotics. Uh, as we see, uh, uh, because the data has been updated to uh, 2018, so in the year, we first, uh, for the first time, we see over 400,000 units of industrial robots are uh, installed globally. And uh, uh, more than 2.4 million industrial robots are operating over the world and it would continue the growth. And uh, we see that uh, Europe and uh, North uh, and uh, North America, the red and uh, the gray, bus, uh, they, their market remains stable and uh, balanced, while the East Asia, uh, while Asia, uh, especially East Asia, is the growth engine. Uh, we can see that uh, about uh, two thirds of the new installed uh, industrial robots are in, in, in Asia. <clears throat> and China remains the main and the single largest market for industrial robots. So you can see the number is about uh, uh, 154,000 uh, units. It uh, accounts nearly 40% of the world all newly installed uh, robots. So China is really the, uh, the developing engine. And, uh, and uh, the, the industrial robots, key industrials are automotive, electronics, and uh, metals. And uh, we, see, uh, we see the bus. Uh, you see the blue one is uh, minus 14%. And the metal and the machinery is minus one uh, percent. It's because of in 2018 the trade war began, so it's uh, affected. And uh, we can see the globally robot density, and uh, the highest uh, robot density lies in Asia. Uh, the Korea, Germany, and uh, Japan lead the world. And China is just above the average. It's just above the average. And the next three pages, you could see the, uh, we see the professional service robots. The main growth drives, uh, drives from logistic systems. Uh, you could see the left bus, the logistics, uh, contribute to the growth in values and in the units. And uh, for service robots, uh, for prof professional use, uh, my personal, uh, I personally think it more, has more chances in business to business uh, related scenarios. These uh, ATVs are prevailing everywhere, especially in China. It's a, a very great, uh, great growth. 
Okay, let's say in China. Uh, during uh, we see the China's uh, grow, uh, uh, market is growing at uh, uh, 40, uh, 42 percent CAGR during past uh, eight years. It's very amazing. It's very amazing. And uh, uh, from uh, 2017 to 2018 is nearly balanced because of the trade war. <coughs> but uh, we could see later it will continue to grow. And uh, robot density in China has been three times higher comparing 2018 to 2015. We think in the next uh, five years, the robot density in China would grow, uh, would grow another three times higher. You can see this bar just uh, in 2015 and 2016, China's density is below the world average. And uh, just three years before China uh, past the average and it's continue grow at a uh, 42% CEGR growth rate. And uh, in China, the and in China, the industries are uh, elect uh, all, all the robots applications are electronics, automotive, and the metal. So the same as the world. And we can see that the blue bars in 2018 affected badly by the trade war. But I think it's a short period adjustment. And from this two cities, we can see that the distribution of industrial robot applications in China are handling, welding, assembly, dispensing, clean room, and the processing. And uh, uh, in most uh, high-end application areas, foreign supplies dominate the market. Uh, Chinese supplies account for less than 13% of the whole market. So you see, China is a very large single market, uh, but it's a big pile and a big uh, uh, kick for the world. The local supplies, they continue to grow, but uh, I think Chinese local supplies and the manufacturers, they still lack experience and uh, accumulation. Okay, next uh, is, uh, I'd like to demonstrate some possible opportunities from the point of, uh, point of view of uh, business to business. Uh, because industrial uh, robots is just a tool, uh, is just a, a tool. So if you want to make money just to sell uh, robots, I think, I don't think you can make a fortune, uh, but uh, I think, uh, industrial robot is uh, more like a solution and a platform. Uh, so I think uh, from point of view of business to business, we can open uh, our mind to see what uh, kind of opportunities might be in China. <laughs> the first, uh, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, China manual Manufacturers, more than 70% of global electronic production, including smart phone, uh, smartphones, computers, and uh, servers, consuming electronics and uh, household electrical uh, uh, appliances. Of all these manufacturing processes, still more than 80% are man, uh, mainly manually, uh, made manually. So I think robot application. Uh, will play a greater uh, potential role. So, for example, I, I, I just give you an example. Uh, you know, Apple smartphones and uh, Chinese brands such like uh, Huawei, Oppo, Vivo, uh, these uh, phones, they use metal, um, use metal back cover, which require polishing 
mostly these work are done in several counties uh, along uh, the Po River in Guangdong province. It's very, uh, a very uh, just uh, several counties in China, in Guangdong province. The polishing produces dust and hurt both human health and the environment. But uh, as I investigated uh, just uh, during the past uh, two years, many of the polishing work order is uh, scattered and, uh, 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 and uh, nearly 70% uh, are finished by workers manually. And uh, ABB robots dominate the polishing market over there. But it is still a very little percent, I think uh, about 10%. About 10 percent. The polishing work carried by robot requires uh, investment. You have to buy the robot, and you have to to pay the the solution package, and you have to to buy the uh, to buy the uh, polishing materials uh, imported from uh, 3M, for for example. And uh, it also requires a professional tooling system, and it also more important, uh, you experience the programming over the curved surface, uh, curved surface. Uh, so it's a challenge, so it's quite challenging for local uh, Chinese uh, manufacturers. So most of the work still are done by, uh, by hand. <coughs> uh, I'll give another example. As most uh, electronic components are very small size, so each workstation is very small. Uh, it's, uh, it only fits one for, uh, for one person. So to promote uh, industrial automation and uh, improve, uh, improve efficiency, lightweight robots are more appropriate. So we can see the Denso from Japan. Uh, they have uh, uh, greater opportunities in these uh, scenarios. And uh, more and more lightweight robots and uh, uh, collabor collaborative robots, the, it's quite a new uh, technology, but uh, it's prevailing now, such as the UR from Denmark, now it's uh, located in USA. And uh, many Chinese startups, they are also, uh, they are also uh, design and uh, manufacturing the collaborative robots. Uh, most of them are used in these scenarios in China. Uh, they can be used uh, for assembling, for uh, screwing, drawing, is painting, and the cetera. A lot of uses, a lot of uh, potential space. And uh, robot reason for detection and assembling are also prevailing in China, especially in electronic production scenarios. And the next, I'd like to discuss the uh, car market or the uh, automotive market. Uh, as we see from Tesla, uh, it's a purely uh, it's a purely electrical vehicle, so uh, we call it EV. So EV is a prevailing in the world. In fact, China leads as the world's largest and the fast growing the EV market. As we see from the figures, uh, left one, China, uh, in the left figure, we see China, uh, it takes more than half of the world EV market. And uh, we see the right side, right side the figure. We see besides, Tesla is the number one. And the second, the third, and the fourth largest world EV manufacturers are all in China are all from China and in China. And it also happened that we, uh, our company, our fund, we invested all of them. And uh, the second the largest one, BYD, B BYD, and the fourth, the SAIC, SAIC. Uh, they are also LPs of our fund. That means they provide the capital to us. So we cooperated with them very closely, very closely. So it's a great advantage for us to uh, to provide 
uh, some facilities and uh, help to our friends if you are interested. And uh, I'd like to talk about uh, Tesla. Uh, Tesla's Gigafactory just uh, started and, uh, uh, and uh, take into operation in 10 months last year. So according to their plan, they would uh, uh, expand their production capacity to half million in this year. So it's very large. It's a very, uh, very quick and a very big growth. And uh, uh, Musk has said that Tesla in the world, they would uh, continue their growth in about 50% CGI in the next five years. And half of their product uh, capacity are in China. So in China and for China, so, so the supply chain is very important. So it's a, the window is just opened. I think it's a great opportunity for the world and for local Chinese. So I will tell you, for instance, if you are interested, you can, uh, you can uh, at this time try to deploy and uh, to seek uh, possible, possible opportunities around the Tesla's supply chain. So I think uh, ink uh, red can help a lot in this place because they are quite near to Tesla, just across uh, Hangzhou, Hangzhou Bay, uh, Hangzhou One Bay. And uh, as for the whole, uh, as, as for the whole Chinese private car, uh, we have built uh, built a model, a mathematical model to study China's we call market trends uh, in the next uh, 10 to 15 years. And uh, we see private car ownership per thousand people is the, uh, is the flag, is the flag. And uh, from this figure, we, uh, we design, uh, we draw this figure ourselves. You can see that by 2019, 2019, and uh, just uh, in China, it's just around 200 cars per thousand people. So we pray, uh, why, in you, why in United States, the number is, uh, I think is 700. In Japan, it's about 600. And in Europe, it's about 500 or 600. So we predict by 2030, China's uh, the number would increase to 30, uh, 310 cars per thousand people. Uh, so we are quite confident and uh, optimistic about China's car market. It's uh, far from balanced and uh, saturated. The traditional ICE cars, the inner, uh, the inner uh, combustion engine cars, still has a large space to grow. So both in the EV and the RCE car market and the manufacturing processes, I think there are many opportunities for our Italian friends uh, to apply robotic applications and uh, automation, automation. For example, the laser welding for battery package. Uh, for later for battery package, uh, and I didn't uh, I don't show the figures of China's uh, China's battery uh, battery capacity about uh, more than half of the world I think uh, the the lithium ion battery yeah and uh, mostly the sport and the arc wedding uh, for car body etc. And beyond the robotic applications, the Kai, I think, uh, the Kai Dynamics design, the powertrain design, and the motor control, and their manufacturing, autom uh, automation manufacturing streamlines, for example, the car test and the inspection, etc. Uh, I think these are all opportunities for our Italian friends. Because uh, as uh, I investigated, 
Chinese uh, car manufacturers, vehicle manufacturers, most of them, they lack experience and uh, technique, uh, but they have, uh, they have good uh, accumulation of the uh, production and uh, channels, uh, distribution channels. Also, China accounts for uh, more than half of the world express logistics, and the data is newly. Uh, in 2019, just the last year, the global express package sum up to uh, 110 billion units. Why China? Why China? You, you can see from this. You can see from this that China is more than half. China is about, uh, I see, uh, six, 600 and, uh, let me see, the, the unit is 100, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, no, 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 no. Uh, the, uh, this color, this color means packages is 100 million units. You can see, uh, you can see the number is, uh, China's number is 635.2. 100 million packages, yeah, in 2019. And uh, China's e-commerce business saw a more than 1,000 percent growth over the last uh, 10 years. And it is still, uh, it is still at uh, growth at a high rate, especially by this, uh, I mean, the co coronavirus uh, affected the, the whole uh, society behavior. So we can see another uh, higher growth rate in e-commerce e in China. And uh, most uh, of these logistics need uh, warehouse and uh, robots and uh, for sorting, for, uh, for packaging and uh, for detection. Uh, so I think these uh, solutions and uh, these techniques and uh, these uh, uh, some products, I think, are also opportunities for Italian brands. And uh, here is uh, China's automation market, uh, mainly OEM automation market. We can see the most of uh, the segmentation market. Uh, the feedback uh, uh, production occupies uh, 23% and the control products about 21%, the drivers, or executors and the motion and the motion controllers, yeah. And the most of the OEM market are mach uh, machinery tooling, electronic packaging, food, HVC, plastics, wind power, construction elevator, textile and others. And uh, here is uh, here is the OEM market uh, uh, deploy of their growth rate. The, the horizontal axis means their, pa uh, their past uh, five years CAGR growth. And uh, the vertical axis uh, stands for their growth in 2018. We can see, for example, the electronics the electronics of OEM automation market in China during past uh, five years before 2018 is about nearly 25% CAGR growth. It's quite, quite high. But uh, because of the trade war in 2018, it drops nearly to, to zero. Yeah. And the machinery tooling is the largest uh, automation market in China. Uh, during uh, the past five years before 2018, its growth CGR is about 5%. But in 2018, it drops to 11 miners, uh, 11 miners. Uh, but there are many other uh, industries uh, have a good uh, have a good status. For example, the construction industry, the textile, in, uh, the textile 
uh, industrial, the HVAC industrial, the medical industrial, package industrial, and uh, uh, plastics, food, lifting, elevator, etc. So you can see by this by this graph, uh, uh, by this graph, you can see the the deployment and the distribution of some of China's automation market. They have their uh, they have their uh, behavior. And uh, in I uh, and there are some typical stories I think I can share with our friends. Uh, most of them are uh, industrial robots, China, uh, China's uh, industrial robot manufacturers. Uh, I'd like to see the Everett robot is located in Anhui uh, province in China. Uh, we can see they have some international mergers and acquisitions. Uh, in 2014, they acquired CMA uh, in Italy. Uh, it's a, a painting, robotic uh, painting solution provider. And uh, 2016, they acquired the Evolut uh, for metal process. And uh, 2017, they acquired the Robot for robot controller. And uh, I think ro uh, Robox is first uh, introduced to China by uh, FIS, uh, by FIS. <clears throat> so all these three companies are from Italy, which means that uh, Italy has a very good uh, accumulation and the techno technology called advantage. And the China, uh, the local suppliers, they have good production and uh, marketing. But they lack experience. They lack the solution, and they lack the the the, the technology. I think, yeah. <clears throat> so you can see what uh, uh, what they are doing. And uh, in 2017, they acquired WFC from Germany for wedding for wedding solutions. And uh, in 2016, China's media group they acquired KUKA from Germany. Uh, uh, just uh, to expand their ability in manufacturing. As for KUKA, I'd like to say that uh, uh, during the four largest uh, ro industrial robot producers in the world, uh, for example, KUKA, ABB, and uh, FANAC, and uh, uh, Kawasaki, KUKA is the least profit one because it's just produce and sell robots. That cannot make a fortune, cannot make a higher profit. And so that's why they can be easily purchased, uh, acquired by a Chinese uh, group, a Chinese uh, firm. But I think it's, uh, let's wait and see what, uh, what they can, what, uh, what the next. And, uh, Aston is located in Nanjing province, uh, Nanjing province, uh, China, uh, uh, Jiangsu province. It's a listed uh, company. Uh, Aston acquired a trio from Britain for motion control, and uh, they acquired clothes just uh, last year uh, for arc wedding, for arc wedding. And uh, Steps is located in Shanghai. It's another industrial robots producer in China. So they have some uh, mergers and acquisitions to China, uh, Chinese local uh, technolo technology providers for motion control and uh, integration. So if you are interested, so you see that- uh, Sorry, China's sorry, sorry, Mr. Song, sorry to, to interrupt okay, yeah. you, sorry. But yeah. we are a bit, uh, <laughs> we um, so my time is up. bit out of time. Yes, yes. Could yeah, you please yeah, like yeah. make a like a very uh, conclusion if you say want to say why last few words about your speech? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so thank you, uh, thank you for all. And uh, I just as I mentioned, uh, our company is CMG SDIC Capital, and we we are the largest. Uh, 
industrial uh, the industrial professional uh, PE investment firm in China. So we have some resources and we have some abilities to help you if you are interested. So let's discuss in detail later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you really, really, yeah. Mr. Song, for your contribution. Very interesting speech. Yeah. So now I don't want to take more time and uh, I give uh, the word to Hanjo Bay. So Mr. Lin and uh, his assistant Alice can give us an introduction to Hanjo Bay and the opportunities in Hanjo Bay. Thank you. Yes? Hello? Hello? Yes. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to introduce Ningbo Hangzhou Bay New Zone on this online meeting. And I will introduce Hangzhou Bay New Zone from three aspects. First is the overview of Ningbo. The second is the overview of Ningbo Hangzhou Bay New Zone. And the third is industrial development advantages of Ningbo Hangzhou Bay New Zone. Now we can see in the picture that the red area is Ningbo. Ningbo is a sub-provincial city of China and is the only municipality with independent planning status in Yangtze Delta. It has the fourth largest port in the world and one of the first batch of cities opening up to the outside world. The land area in Ningbo is 9,816 square kilometers and the population is about 8.5 million people. These are the economic indicators of Ningbo in 2019. For example, GDP is about 1,198.5 billion in 2019. The, that is ranked the second among all municipalities with independent planning status. And the revenue in public budgets is about 146.85 billion, increased by 6.4% compared to the previous years. Thus, on 0.1% national land area, Ningbo contributed to 1.2% of national GDP and 1.5% of fiscal revenue. And on 9% of provincial land area, Ningbo contributed to 19.2% of provincial GDP and 22.7% fiscal revenue of Zhejiang province. Now I'd like to talk about the overview of Ningbo Hangzhou Bay New Zone. The red area here is Ningbo Hangzhou Bay New Zone. It is on the south wing of Yangtze Delta with the most developed economy in China and in the south of Ningbo, Zhejiang province. Ningbo Hangzhou Bay New Zone is in the geometric center of several big cities made up of Shanghai, Suzhou, Hangzhou, and Ningbo. In Ningbo, Hangzhou, Bay New Zone, there are national economic and technological development zone, national export processing zone, national demonstration area of city industry integration, national wetland park, provincial industry cluster area, Zhejiang, Shanghai cooperation demonstration area. The land area is 353 square kilometers and the sea area is about 350 square kilometers. At present, the population is about 300,000. Now we are working on to make Hangzhou Bay New Zone a famous international industry city and also a beautiful modern Bay Area. In both Hangzhou Bay New Zone, um, always ranks among the best and has attained four champions in seven years. These are the major economic indicators in 2019. Uh, for example, 
uh, the general financial revenue of the new zone in 2019 reached about 17 billion yuan. That is an average annual increase of 32.7%. Uh, since the the red area is Nibo Hangzhou Bay New Zone, and this is Hangzhou Bay, so in this large Bay Area, surrounded by Hangzhou Bay, we have one plus two plus three plus x spatial layout. One represents for Shanghai, two represents for Hangzhou and Nibo, three represents for cities that is Zhongshan. Jiaxing and Shaoxing. X covers all the coastal and hinterland areas within the radiation range. This is the master planning of Hangzhou Bay New Zone, which is divided into three sections from the west to east. The west, wetland leisure area, the middle, new business district area, and the east, high end industrial zone. These are the bird's eye view of, the, of these three sections. The wetland leisure area picture, uh, the middle new business district picture, and the east high end industrial zone picture. We have uh, pillar industry systems that is one plus three plus three. They are automobile industry digital economy industry, life and health industry, household appliances industry, aviation industry, new material industry, cultural tourism industry. At present, there are about 510 companies introduced in the new zone, among which 20 to 4,500 with 40 projects have introduced in the new zone. These are the star companies located in Hangzhou Bay New Zone. For example, Shanghai Volkswagen, Geely, Honeywell, Bosch, Fosia, Eaton, and Face Motion Control is also located in our Hangzhou Bay New Zone. This is about the automobile industry in the New Zone. Our target is to build the New Zone into a new coordinate leading the technological reform of global automobile industry. At present, there are two Finnish automobile manufacturing companies in the new zone. They are Geely and Shanghai Volkswagen, and also of more than 150 auto spare parts companies. Currently, the production capacity of the Finnish automobile is about 1.6 million vehicles per year. In 2018, the production and sales of Finnish automobile is 573,000. And the out output of value of Finnish automobile and auto parts is about 100.16 billion yuan. This picture is R&D center of Delia Wall. And this page talks about the digital econ economy industry in Hangzhou Bay New Zone. The planned area for digital economy is 11,653 11, mu. In this digital economy industry park, we integrate an R&D center, manufacturing base, comprehensive service area, and living area. These are the master planning of the digital economy industry. Phase one has already been launched. Phase two and phase three are under construction. At present, there are about 17 projects in digital economies with total investment of about 6.4 billion yuan introduced in the new zone. In future, more than 30 research institutions and more than 100 manufacturing enterprises will be introduced. This 
the left the left picture is a plot one production supporting area. This is developed by a state-owned enterprise in the new zone with total investment of about 1.2 billion yuan. The land area is about 405 mu. And the floor area about 360,000 square meters. The construction has been completed and put into use in September 2018. So far, 14 enterprises have been settled down. The right picture is a plot two production supporting area. This supporting area will is, is, is expected to be completed in June this year. This page is, talks about the life and health industry in the new zone. The output value of life and health industry in the new zone will exceed 20 billion RMB and the scientific research personnel will go beyond 10,000. These are the star companies in life and health industry. For example, Pharma Life Science and Technology Industry Park, MSD China Animal Health Products R&D and Manufacturing Base, Shuangche Pharma Farmeron Laboratory Workshop, etc. These are the aviation uh, land, aviation projects that we are going to develop. This picture took, talks about the leisure tour, tourism and sports. Uh, we have the largest uh, wetland in East Asia with a total area of about 63.8 square kilometers, among which 3.3 square kilometers wetland have already been open to public. In 2019, the new zone has received tourists over 6 million people and realized tourism income of about 1.3 billion IB. This is from Tile Theme Park. And also we have held several international marathon sports to enhance the reputation of Hangzhou Bay New Zone. Besides, we've invested about 380 million yuan in the development of sports park. Sports park. The, the last part, I'd like to talk about the industry development advantages of Ningbo Hangzhou Bay New Zone. The red area is Ningbo Hangzhou Bay New Zone. In this two hour traffic circle, we are easy access to four international airports and two ports. There are two in Shanghai, Shanghai Hongqiao Airport, Shanghai Putong Airport, one in Hangzhou, Hangzhou Xiaoshan Airport, and one in Ningbo, Ningbo Lishi Airport. And also two international ports, they are Port of Zhoushan and Shanghai Yangshan Port. At present, we take this sea crossing passenger from Hangzhou Bay New Zone to Shanghai. It takes about 1.5 hour drive. But we have also another sea crossing dual use passenger under construction here. This is called Shanghai Jiaxin Ningbo Intercity Railway. It has already started construction and Upon completion, it will only take 35 minutes from New Zone to Shanghai. Also, we, there is a Hangzhou Shaoxing Yimbo Expressway and it will be completed by the year of 2022. With this highway, the speed will increase by 20 to 30 percent and it will only take 30 minutes drive from Ningbo Hangzhou Bay New Zone to Hangzhou. This picture talks about uh, the industrial supply chain in and around Hangzhou Bay New Zone. Since uh, our Hangzhou Bay New Zone locates in the area of China's most important auto parts and mode manufacturing base, 
So within one hour traffic drive, we are easy access to mold, auto pass, household appliances, electronic information, plastic injection mold machinery, punching machine production, metal processing base, and new material and plastic products. This picture shows the spacious development area for big projects to locate in Nova Hangzhou Bay New Zone. For example, the red area is land under construction. The green area is the land that has already been re reclaimed. And the brown area is land to be developed. So there is a, a abundant land space for big projects and big companies. So this is in the middle that is middle part that is new business district. We divide this new business dis district into two parts, the southern town and the northern Binghai town. Uh, in the southern new town, we, uh, we will have three functions, the tourism resort, scientific research, and environmental friendly living quarters. And in the Binghai New Town, we are working to build the Binghai New Town, a model town in 21st century China. Here are the uh, bird's eye view of picture, bird's eye view of the Southern New Town the Central City Urban Complex, the Hobson Urban Complex, and the Scientific and Technological Venture Service Center. Here are the bird's eye view of the effect picture of Northern Binghai New Town. For example, Zhuyue Guangu Inno Town with total investment of about 6.5 billion yuan. Greenland Healthcare Town with total investment of about 12 billion yuan. And CTS Culture Town with total investment of about 12 billion yuan. Huachan China Renaissance Culture Park Project with total investment of about 12.8 billion yuan. These, these are big projects to be developed in the future. Also, we have very comprehensive supporting facilities. For example, we have a comprehensive hospital that is in Hangzhou Bay Hospital, which is a branch of Shanghai Renqi Hospital, the financial cluster, the sports parks, and Century Golden Shopping Mall. We have very complete education system in the new zone from elementary education to vocational education and higher education. For example, uh, we have Hangzhou Bay Auto, Automobile College. Uh, we have also a new middle school called Ningbo Science Middle School with total investment of about 0 0.52 billion yuan occupies an area of 116 mu. And Binghai Primary School with total investment of about 0 0.26 billion yuan and area of about 84 mu. Have some problem with the audio. With the Hangzhou Bay. Hello. Some audio problem with the Hangzhou Bay. With the connect. Sure. We cannot hear anymore. Sorry, but okay.
Hello? Can you hear us? I think, uh, anyway, I think the speech was almost over. I think now we can, um, we can give the word to our next guest, that is uh, Jack, uh, the Mr. Mr. Lee, that is a, is a lawyer, will talk about us about uh, copyright. Okay, and uh, I share with you uh, this. Okay, Mr. Lee, are you there? Mr. Lee? Hello? Mr. Lee? Mr. Lee, can you hear us? Oh, wait a moment. Sorry, Mr. Hello, Mr. Lee, can you try again? Sorry. Sorry, I cannot hear you. Hello? Can, can you try without the, the airplugs? Can you try without that? Sorry for a... Scusate per l'attesa, abbiamo un inconveniente tecnico. Vediamo. Hello? Hello, Mr. Lee, can you hear us? Uh, yes, hi. Okay, okay. So you, I, I have actually already shared your PPT. You can, you can start uh, your uh, speech. Hello? Hello? Jack, sorry? Hello? Mr. Lee? Sorry, sorry to all of you. Alberto, forse possiamo passare al prossimo, al successivo? Eh, eh sì, possiamo Alessandro a sto punto. Alessandro, ci senti? Eh, Alberto? Sì? sì? Un, un attimino solo, scusa, che sto finendo un... Sì. Mi puoi dare un minuto? Sì, aspettiamo un minuto, scusate, purtroppo le connessioni con la Cina ci sono questi inconvenienti tecnici. Arrivo subito, eh? Abbi pazienza un secondo. Scusate, sì. Oh, I can hear you, but I'm not sure why you cannot hear me, so... Okay, Mr. Lee, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, 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 so let, let's try, let's try with your speech, okay? Let's try. Okay. okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, now I can hear you, luckily. Okay, okay. I share your PPT. Okay, please, please. Okay, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Jack, and uh, I'm a lawyer, as you know. And uh, my practice actually focuses on intellectual property, which I think uh, is very close related to today's topic about uh, uh, smart manufacturing in China. So I, 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 I'm not sure if you can, uh, you can if you have any, any uh, experience doing business in China or doing transactions with Chinese parties. But uh, today I'm going to share with you some, some uh, three basic topics about uh, intellectual property. Uh, the first one is about uh, the patent protection in China. The second one is about the uh, unfair competition uh, aspect. Uh, 
And the third one is about uh, the trauma protection in China. I think uh, all these three aspects of uh, intellectual property protection actually very important for, for, China, for China, for doing business in China, or doing business with the Chinese party. So let, let's go to the first one, patent protection, please. Uh, uh, there are two very important, uh, very most updated uh, trends that I would like to share with you. Uh, the first one is that uh, uh, the new patent law in China actually is going to 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 have a longer patent term, which means for for some kind of a patent, for example, sorry, I have an incoming call. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Please. I I'm I'm going to 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 disable my cell phone. Okay. So for we have three different types of patent in China. The invention patent, the utility model, and the design patent. I think a design patent is very important for manufacturing industry, not only in China but also in Italy. For example, if you have a very unique design for your product, which means that you can, you can have an exclusive right over that design, which means you can stop anybody else using the similar or same design as you. So uh, before we amend the patent law, we have only 10 years of protection period for design patent which is quite normal for almost all countries all over the world. But now we are going to have a 15 years, 15 years protection for design. And more importantly, it is very easy for a company to apply for design patent protection. You don't need to go through the substantial examination once you file an application for design patent, then you will have a certificate. You have a grant of patent protection. To introduce a new product into China, my recommendation is that you should firstly consider filing patent application in China. If you have a very good, unique, very new design for your product, you should at least file a design patent application in China. Also, I, I'm not sure if you have a, I'm not sure if any, any of our attendees today uh, actually in pharmaceutical product industry. I assume there may be someone and uh, then we will have a we will have a additional five years protection for new drug if you have your drug go on market at the same time both in china and both in both on abroad so this is very new for patent protection in china how about uh, i think we can go to the next okay, page. sure also, uh, in terms of patent protection, we will have a higher compensation system for patent infringement case. Especially in terms of intentional infringement, means malicious infringement. If, you're, if the infringer is actually is infringing upon your patent, at a bad face and uh, the circumstances are very severe, then we can file a litigation before court claiming for five times compensation, five times, which is a 
quite quite good for patent owner. Also, if you don't have evidence to prove your loss or the illegal profits by the infringer, then you can resolve to court to decide as the court discretion, which means the court uh, maybe will support your claim at five million yuan, five million yuan, five million, five million RMB. If you have a zero evidence to show your your loss or or, or the infringer's profit, which is very, also very good, and. Under many circumstances, the IP owner don't have any evidence to show the infringer's profit. Before we amend the patent law, we have no nothing to do. We have no we have no choice but subject to court, subject subject to judge's decision. But now we can file a formal application and ask for uh, for submission by the infringer related to the accounting books and the accounting materials so that we can calculate calculate the illegal profit this is a mandatory and this is the legal rights that every IP owner, they can enjoy during the legal proceedings. We now, we are supported by law and we can file application to the court to ask for help to dig out the financial information of the infringer. I think this is also important and helpful for IP owners enforcing their IP rights in China. Let's go on next slide. Uh, now I, I think I, I, I'm dis discussing slide six. We have uh, several model cases in China about uh, patent protection over the past years. You can see in China, we have uh, more and more cases actually have a higher compensation. If you think about the uh, the compensation amount ten years ago, this is a, absolutely a very good improvement. But still, you can see we are still far away from Western countries such as United States and European countries. But I would say we are we are in the process of improving. Some of the cases actually handled by me, uh, for example, the last one, the, the, the case I represented on behalf of a Sony, uh, a cell phone manufacturer in China. And uh, this is a very, very important case in the patent industry. Uh, Another aspect that I would like to address about the patent protection in China is actually about uh, the slide seven, about the, about the preservation procedure. The preservation is about, is about what? It's about evidence. In China, we don't have a, in, we, we don't have a discovery procedure similar like the United States, you will have a discovery procedure so that the plaintiff can discover all evidence they will need. But in China, we don't have that procedure. So in many cases, the patent owner, they don't have evidence to, to support infringement. How can they do? How can they obtain the infringing product? How can they obtain the financial books of the infringer? So all these questions are actually cannot resolved without preservation procedure. So now situation is changing. You can see from the chart more and more 
patent owners, they are, they are, they are filing applications to the court for what? For preservation. Preservation on what? Preservation on evidence that the plaintiff, the IP owner, cannot secure by themselves. So they file application for preservation before a competent court and then to ask the court helps them to find, to secure evidence. For example, I have a case. I have a case that uh, related to a very big, a big set of equipment located in, in, in central China. Uh, but I, I filed an application for evidence preservation before court. And the court support me. And the court sent dozens of people, I mean, including police, including court clerk, including judge. Over 20 different people went to the workshop of infringer and to take pictures, to take videos, to record every technical features of the infringement uh, of the infringing product, which is very important because for plaintiff, they, without the help from court, the plaintiff cannot secure all these evidence. So that means preservation procedure is very important for plaintiff. It's very important for, for, for IP owner. And now we slide eight, you can see, you can see that over 80% preservation application is actually approved by the court. This is very good. Uh, this is all I want to share with you about the patent protection in China. The second topic, let's let's go to let's go to let's go to slides eleven. Slide slide eleven or twelve? Okay. Oh yes, twelve. And competition protection in China, I there's a there the actually we we have a we have a, we don't have a trade secret law in China. We don't have a trade secret law in China, but we we also protect any kind of trade secret such as. such as a product formulation client list. So I think it's a, it's a very important to let you know that we, we, we do have a secret protection system. Also, I would like to share with you a very important case, which is also related to an internal company in the slides 14, Ferrero case. I think everybody here uh, they must know Ferrero is a very important brand for Italian company. Uh, actually, Ferrero won a very important case in China about a unique package. You know, some, some infringers, they are not using the Ferrero training, but they are using the unique package, the unique decoration, the unique case of a Ferrero. And the Chinese, Chinese court support the Ferrero and uh, Ferrero win the case, which means, and uh, I, I think we can go to the, the, the third part, the third part about the trademark protection. Trademark protection, also we have a, we have a five times, five times the composition system now. And uh, we are actually going to crack down malicious squatters, infringers. If the trademark is, is hijacked 
by by our business partner or by our by our customers or by our partners in China, then you can engage a lawyer in China to get your trademark back. So uh, let's go to the let's go to the 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 slides nineteen. There is a, also a very important case. I think uh, the brand is also very famous in Italy, but also in China, the Moncler case. Moncler case. The Moncler case actually is the first case the Chinese court fully support the three million composition. Given the Moncler cannot give any evidence about the illegal profit or its loss. So you will see Italian companies in China is actually facing a friendly, a IP owner friendly legal system. So if you want to do business in China, if you want to do business with Chinese parties, don't worry. You only need a good IP lawyer to protect your interests in China, just like me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Li, for your contribution. Very, very interesting. And uh, uh, now, now is the time to give the word to our Italian guest, Alessandro. Alessandro, uh -huh. are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, very good. Quindi passiamo pure all'italiano. Alessandro ci darà il suo intervento in italiano. In italiano, che come dicevo all'inizio, ha vissuto in Cina per più di dieci anni. Insomma, ci racconterà un po' della sua esperienza, di dove lavora, così, insomma, per avere un punto di vista particolare. Prego. Ok, buongiorno a tutti. Uh, I speak, uh, I speak in Italian, right? Eh? Yes, please. <laughs> ok. It's ok. E, um, quindi, come diceva Alberto, io sono in Cina ormai dal 2005 e sono il responsabile della um, progettazione motori nella Uh, Physis Motion Control, un'azienda che è nata vent'anni fa, eh, nel 2000, sì, 2001, eh, da una joint venture con la Phase Motion Control eh, SPA eh, di Genova, eh, dell'ingegner Marco Venturini. Penso che, che è nel, nel settore della, mh, dei motori elettrici o comunque della... Eh, delle applicazioni industriali dovrebbe conoscerlo. Comunque, insomma, è diventato la face motion control, è diventata famosa eh, circa 25 anni fa per i telescopi, per aver preso la commessa del Grand Tecan, che era il telescopio delle Canarie, di più di 10 metri di diametro, no? Quindi è stata la prima azienda italiana e composta da più o meno otto persone, perché ai tempi quelli erano, a prendere questo progetto. E, per fare questi motori a magneti permanenti, che diciamo era il core business della Phase Motion Control, servivano ovviamente dei magneti. E, e l'unico posto, cioè l'unico, uno dei posti dove la natura ha distribuito le terre rare è appunto la Cina e quindi tutti quanti andavano in Cina ad acquistare magneti per queste applicazioni industriali dei motori brushless. Mr. Venturini è andato in, appunto nelle varie fiere, ha incontrato Mr. Ren e che ai tempi appunto aveva un ufficio di trade come molti e trattava magneti appunto e quindi in una delle tante fiere ha proposto si era proposto a Venturini come fornitore di magneti. E da lì, diciamo, questo era nel 2000, 1999 più o meno, e da lì poi la cosa, diciamo, il rapporto si è sviluppato sempre di più, dopodiché Ren, eh, Ren Wen Ji ha pensato, diciamo, di fare questa, di aprire questa joint venture, di fare questa partnership con Venturini, perché ai tempi, negli anni 2000, in Cina non c'erano praticamente aziende eh, sicuramente cinesi, comunque pochissime aziende, aziende tranne i brand più conosciuti che potessero 
fare, avere un prodotto di motion control, quindi motore eh, a magnete permanenti, cioè comunque motore brushless, più inverter per il, per il suo controllo. La Phase Motion Control ai tempi aveva ovviamente entrambi i prodotti e più era molto famosa per questi progetti speciali di telescopi, perché poi il, gran, il grande can delle Canarie è stato il primo, ma poi ce ne sono stati altri. E diciamo che dal 2001 è stata costituita questa joint venture dove c'era la partecipazione del 52% da parte italiana e eh, diciamo è stato aperto diciamo, questo, questa, questo portale per avere questo supporto tecnologico a questa consociata cinese. All'inizio chiaramente in Cina c'era pochissimo mercato eh, diciamo, disponibile, tra virgolette, ma prevalentemente perché molte applicazioni seguivano le, i, diciamo, i canoni tradizionali di, di automazione. Poi piano piano chiaramente c'è stata un, una crescita del business fino ad arrivare al 2007-2007 eh, dove c'è stata questa esplosione del Save Energy e quindi moltissime applicazioni, specialmente nell'injection molding machine, quindi nell'iniezione plastica, richiedevano sistemi eh, a basso consumo energetico. E quindi, diciamo, l'applicazione tradizionale motore asincrono con, con l'inverterino, con, diciamo, col controllo standard, comunque non aveva queste efficienze e, e quindi piano piano sono stati sostituiti. Ai tempi l'ITN, che forse qualcuno di voi conosceva, non lo so, comunque è un'azienda che produce macchine di azione plastica lì a Nimbo, a Beilun, dove siamo noi, aveva cominciato ad integrare questi sistemi motopompa, si chiamavano, ehm, senza avere particolarmente successo, la FASE è riuscita invece ad inserire questa integrazione motore, pompa e azionamento in modo, ehm, in modo brillante, tra virgolette, sul mercato e quindi da lì, diciamo, sono dal 2007, 2006, diciamo 2006, è cominciato questa esplosione di... Di produzione, quindi siamo passati da poche centinaia di motori prodotti al mese, siamo passati a mille, 1500, 2000, 3000, arrivati fino a 5000 solo per alcune applicazioni. E in tutto questo contesto, chiaramente la Face Italia eh, ovviamente aveva il proprio business internazionale per motori ad alta coppia, eh, che però non riusciva, non sono mai riusciti a a prendere campo in Cina in quel momento, no? perché per i costi, perché proprio per una tradizione di alcune applicazioni. E quindi diciamo la Cina comunque con questo save energy dei motori industriali, tra virgolette, quindi quelli più a catalogo, che poi in realtà a catalogo non erano, ma erano tutti speciali, ha avuto, diciamo, questa... è diventata famosa nel, nel settore e, e credo che poi a quei tempi fosse quasi, credo fosse la numero uno, anzi non credo, era la numero uno proprio come, come produttrice di, servo, di motori per servopompa. Da lì, diciamo, il mio contributo è nato, diciamo, è stato dato, dal, è stato offerto nel 2005 alla Face Motion Control Cina, perché comunque ho ritenuto che fosse un'esperienza più interessante e più formativa rispetto a quello del, che poteva avere in Italia. Perché comunque in Cina c'era molte cose, diciamo c'era un terreno ancora vergine, tra virgolette, quindi ci si poteva sbizzarrire un po' in, tanti, eh, in, tanti, in tante progettazioni, no? cosa che magari in Italia e in Europa era, era più difficile, la competizione era sicuramente, era ed è sicuramente più... Uh, più dura no? e, e quindi si aveva modo in Cina di fare molta più esperienza no? quindi c'erano molti più uh, potenziali molte più potenziali applicazioni su cui si poteva andare e addirittura diciamo in modo molto, molto più vasto no? e, e quindi niente poi siamo anno dopo anno il turnover della Cina è cresciuto credo che chi di voi ha visto qualche introduzione 
abbiamo fatto di Incred, del plan cinese. Siamo, io quando sono arrivato in Cina l'azienda contava un'ottantina di persone ed erano già tante, e, però ottantina di persone che pre, prevalentemente facevano trade business poi, lavoravano per il trade business. A distanza di qualche anno l'azienda è arrivata a crescere di un centinaio di unità per anno, no? Quindi siamo passati da un centinaio nel 2005 ad essere un migliaio oggi, e con un turnover decisamente molto più importante. Oggi la phase, eh, la phase motion control Nimbo non si chiama più phase, ma si chiama physis, perché quattro anni fa è stata, diciamo, ehm, interrotta la joint venture. Questo perché in Cina eh, le policy per la quotazione in borsa di aziende cinesi non permettevano di avere in, in, partner stranieri a, di maggioranza e neanche che non parte di minoranza ai tempi. E quindi il processo di... Eh, diciamo di il listening per l'IPO è cominciato più o meno già da sette anni, però poi si è consolidato nel momento che è stata interrotta la joint venture. Ovviamente la, abbiamo mantenuto brand e pro, alcuni prodotti fino a quel momento. E la Cina chiaramente eh, ha dovuto poi creare, cer, mh, creare nuovi business, uno dei business che oggi è quello che è proiettato per il futuro è la parte di electric vehicle, quindi veicoli elettrici, attrazione elettrica e ed ibridi, chiaramente. Eh, la Cina, la Fese Cina ha investito in una linea, in un dipartimento e in un centro di produzione quasi autom completamente automatizzato per produrre questi powertrain che sono delle unità che, dovrebbero, che vanno a sostituire il motore endotermico sulle automobili. Quindi parliamo di unità di, insomma, di potenze che vanno da delle utilitarie tipo un appunto, quindi parliamo di, di motori da 70 cavalli fino a motori da 130, 140, 150 cavalli. Quindi questo diciamo, è uno dei core business oggi, la phase, nimble, physis, si sta diversificando su diversi settori. Uno è quello della, della trazione elettrica, uno è quello dell'automazione della, um, della, um, delle servopresse e um, delle applicazioni controllo numerico. Quindi vuol dire controllo numerico, parliamo di servopresse, quindi um, tutta la parte di eh, deformazione dei materiali e tutta la parte di lavorazione plastica dei materiali, quindi asportazione di truccio. E eh, un'altra parte sono i progetti speciali, quelli che sono più legati al, eh, all'interno della Cina. Quindi stiamo parlando di applicazioni per funivie, anziché applicazioni per miniere estra estrattive di carbone, per acciaierie o per estrazione di petrolio. Quindi questi, questi settori sono dei settori dove oggi la Cina sta investendo tantissimo perché chiaramente eh, sono tutti mirati ad avere un'alta un efficienza. Quindi i sistemi tradizionali di solito sono molto meno efficienti e eh, con, confrontati con questi anche molto meno affidabili. L'ultimo settore è quello della conversione dell'energia, quindi parliamo di eh, generatori eolici anziché di sistemi per, di supporto per la produzione di eh, energia in modo eolico, quindi motori che fanno, fanno l'orientamento delle, delle pale, nei, diciamo nelle giranti de, delle turbine eoliche e diciamo che questi quattro core business sono oggi il la piattaforma della, della Physis Motion Control Nimbo. Scusami, scusami Alessandro se mi inserisco, semplicemente avevi così piacere, a parte questi aspetti tecnici molto interessanti, avevi piacere magari dire due parole proprio brevemente, così anche della tua esperienza proprio personale in Cina, a prescindere dagli aspetti. 
tempo più industriali, visto che eh, è previsto oltre dieci anni tempo, in Cina, eh, Nimbo... Dal punto, di vista, dal punto di vista lavorativo è legata sicuramente a tutti gli aspetti di sviluppo della, diciamo, de, della crescita dell'azienda della, dell cinese. E in livello personale, chiaramente io eh, ho chiaramente spostato la mia, la, le, le, mie, le mie abitudini, la mia vita in Cina in modo qua, più o meno quasi permanente, poi in realtà eh, non sono un completo espat perché poi eh, ho sempre fatto un 60-40 diciamo, quindi 60% in Cina e 40% in Italia. Eh, ho fatto una famiglia in Cina che oggi è qui con me felicemente in Italia, quindi siamo tutti in quarantena, abbiamo spostato la quarantena da un posto all'altro. E, e devo dire che è stata un'esperienza un sicuramente positiva dal punto di vista professionale, positiva dal punto di vista personale, difficile all'inizio perché chiaramente quando sono arrivato in Cina 15 anni fa, anche se la Cina era già cambiata rispetto ad altri italiani che erano arrivati molto prima di me, però comunque eravamo ancora, specialmente a Nimbo, in uno stato di sviluppo, no? Quindi, eh, tu andavi in giro e trovavi, non so, il, i ragazzini che ti guardavano e dicevano, oh, guarda, c'è uno straniero lì, e ti guardavano come se fossi una bestia rara, tra virgolette. E poi comunque è stato interessante perché la, ovviamente la Cina è un posto lontano, e non solo geograficamente, ma anche culturalmente. E quindi poi ti devi, per, so, per sopravvivere, comunque per... Mh, per poter vivere bene, tranquillamente, in modo da fare la tua vita, ti devi integrare il più possibile. Se non ti integri è molto difficile che poi riesci ad avere un... un ad ottimizzare eh, tutto quello che fai. Quindi se ti manca il cibo, per esempio, è bene che non te lo fai mancare, perché adesso trovi un sacco di ristoranti italiani, ma a Nimbo ai tempi non ce n'era neanche uno. Ai tempi all'inizio parliamo inizio anni 2000, quindi? 2000, eh no, nel 2005, io sono 2000, arrivato, 2005, okay. ho cominciato nel 2005, perché sono andato in Cina la prima volta nel 2004, a fine del 2004, e poi ho cominciato a lavorare con Ren alla fine del 2005, a settembre. E a quei tempi Nimba era veramente eh, proprio all'inizio, no? quindi era completamente diverso da oggi e, e probabilmente è riconoscibile, no? se io... Credo che dopo questo anno che, diciamo, di mancanza forzata dalla Cina a Rio Ento, troverò delle cose ancora diverse. Quindi diciamo che ehm, lo svilu la velocità di sviluppo che trovi in Cina, che ho trovato in Cina, non l'ho mai trovato in Italia, chiaramente. Quindi diciamo, a livello personale è stata sicuramente un'esperienza positiva, però ripeto, difficile. Probabilmente adesso è molto più facile per chi va oggi in Cina perché trovi molti più supporti, magari, anche per la tua vita tradizionale, no? Quindi, ripeto, sicuramente la parte, la parte culinaria è uno degli aspetti che devi affrontare subito. E poi ci sono tutte le altre abitudini, no? Le abitudini di vita normale e quant'altro. Io guido in Cina, ho, preso la, ho convertito la patente nel 2006, e quello è un altro di quegli aspetti interessanti, perché chiaramente all'inizio c'erano pochissime regole nella guida, no? E, e quindi già come italiani ne abbiamo poche, ma lì devo dire che, che ne ho trovato ancora meno. E quindi oggi, ad esempio, c'è tutto, un tutto, un tutto un altro disegno, no? Quando vai in giro sicuramente ci sono molte più... Le persone sono più attente, sono più regolarizzate nel, nel determinati comportamenti e tutto quanto. Forse oggi sono più ligi, sono più ligi di, quanti, di quanto possiamo, possiamo essere noi. Quindi questo più o meno è un po' la, quello che ho visto io. Ho visto tanti posti, chiaramente, poi tutti quanti più o meno accumulati da determinate cose. Ci sono alcune cose che ho accettato in modo pieno, altre che ad oggi non comprendo e credo che questa sia una cosa abbastanza normale, anche se mia moglie è cinese, quindi ho avuto modo di sicuramente di imparare tantissimo e di capire tantissimo, però ci sono alcune, alcuni aspetti che 
ci rendono proprio distanti, no? Quindi l'aspetto culturale è molto distante. Secondo me è, è molto apprezzabile l'impegno che molti, molti, molti cinesi mettono nel poter eh, nel, capire la cultura occidentale, ma secondo me nel loro, nel loro, nel loro, nella loro dinamica del capire la, la cultura occidentale perdono la propria, che secondo me è giusto mantenere. E quindi poi si creano un po' degli obrobri e delle cose un po' strane che forse stonano un po' con, con il contesto. Quindi questo è un po' quello che ho, che ho visto io. Ok. Beh, gra grazie, grazie mille Alessandro per il tuo, tuo, tuo intervento, molto, molto interessante assolutamente. Ecco, adesso diciamo abbiamo terminato i nostri interventi di oggi, i contributi sono, sono terminati. In realtà ci scusiamo, siamo andati un po' oltre i tempi previsti. Ecco, volevamo chiedere se, se magari qualcuno tra del pubblico, dell'audience, aveva piacere di fare qualche domanda, può farla tramite chat oppure può anche direttamente parlare, fare la domanda a uno, a uno degli speaker che ci sono ancora. Noi, noi siamo qua. E, ecco. Nessuno. <ride> It's also to English if someone now wants to ask uh, okay, some question, uh, it's, uh, you can do it by in the chat or also freely talk. Uh, this is a kind of a meeting so we can talk directly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ma um, sulla parte, uh, I have a question about the, um, the, the patent today in China. Ok, so to Mr. So Mr. Lee. To Mr. Okay, Lee. and we have another question from uh, Mr. Giuseppe to Mr. Lee. So first we answer Mr. Lee, please, uh, to Alessandro. If you... So, um, one thing I, I would like to understand is about the, the protection on the intellectual property in China. You before say that uh, the policy changed, so today there is uh, more protection on intellectual property. So this means that, uh, because what I see that we have always to create several patents yearly in our company to, to guarantee the, the technology, the know-how level uh, in front of the um, institution, no? So, Uh, what I want to understand is what is the value of the patent today in China compared with the, with the uh, America or Europe even. Because it seems sometimes the patent, what I noted is uh, uh, there is a different level of patent. Now there is some patent which is, uh, uh, seems a patent the what water sometimes, no? And in other case, it seems a patent is much more Uh, complex, but I never catch what is the really um, value of this patent, the Chinese patent, compared maybe in the worldwide patents. So, okay, thank you, thank you. This is a very good question. Uh, firstly, I want to make sure that you can hear me. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can. Okay, great. So, uh Uh, actually, we have uh, three different types of patents in China. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we call it uh, the first two. Technical features, I mean, for example, uh, a, crea a creative product or mm -hmm. creative process. And but from utility model actually is different with the uh, invention patent because invention patent in China we call a bigger patent. Oh, But okay. uh, for utility model and the design patent we call small patent. Hmm. Why we 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 actually we, we classify into different categories because uh, for invention patent we have a uh, 20 years uh, 20 years protection period. Mm -hmm. 
mm. but for utility model only 10 years mm. and for design pattern you can see before the law is mandated is actually only 10 years but after the after the the new law comes into effective it will be 15 years so mm. you can see it's different different arrangement in china's law system also there is uh, another very big difference <coughs> between these uh, among these three different types of patents for invention patent well, the application will have to go through or pass through the substantial examination by officials at the state intellectual property office which means that uh, your patent if you want to to ask for protection of your invention patent means you have to go through uh, at least uh, two or three or even four years oh, substantial process. examination oh. so which is a very you know very very difficult for for invention for creation to be to be granted for invention patent oh. but for differently for utility model and design pattern you just need to go through a formality i mean formality of application and you can have a certificate within uh, around the half a year or six mm. or nine months after your, your submitted application you don't need to go through a substantial examination which means for for utility model and design patent mm. Technically speaking, it would be very, very easy to be invalidated because oh, okay. yeah. nobody knows whether or not they are new or not. Mm -hmm. So but, everybody can repatent something or not? Yeah, same. exactly. They can invalidate and can initiate the invalidation proceeding. So the, let's say the first one, so the big patent, the, so the invention patent is which is uh, in the same level of the international patent, let's say uh yeah but i i think i don't have a much knowledge about the uh, overseas patent system but i as far as i know united states they also have different types of patent mm -hmm. yeah 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 also in italy yeah sure, sure. yeah and uh, but another very important point i would like to share with you is that uh, this this is not true only invention patent could be protected in china I will give you an example. There is a milestone case, it actually also between a Chinese company and a European company, uh, a Snyder. You know the Snyder case? Mm -hmm. Snyder has a, has a patent infringement case in China. A Snyder is actually the, the, the defendant. And uh, the involved patent is actually not a invention patent, but actually the utility model patent. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese party is a plaintiff, is the IP owner. And the first instance judged by, by, by intermediate court is actually over a big amount. I mean, uh, if I remember correctly, it's actually over 200 million RMB. Oh, well. So which is very good. I mean, it's true that a utility model or design pattern actually is a small pattern, but still very valuable. Because okay. the only difference is actually they are they are not suitable for invention pattern protection, but probably they are good for design or utility model protection. So for, the, for example, for industrial they, for general yes, purpose anyway, more. Yeah, for example, for example, uh, 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 G, we say for a new design for, for a new car, Mm -hmm. The design pattern will, will be very important, very valuable, right? Okay, okay, okay. So it's a different for design pattern for for new drug, no value, <laughs> right? So it depends. It depends what what kind of depends creation, what kind of IP you want yeah, to protect. But so means uh, in China, if for example, if I use one solution already patent, whatever in the utility or in the design patent. Uh, uh, I also should pay. So if they find out I use this, uh, they can claim to me uh, to the a sort of court or ask me the rights. Is it correct? Yes, exactly. 
right so what you say that for the utility utility patent let's say which are more maybe linked with the um some structure extra field or some important field maybe this is a very valuable more valuable exactly you utility model that covers the technical features i mean yeah. in that uh, how many different parts of the product and how can they connect each other uh, the, the, so know. also the solution to the, the, the yeah they touch the technical solution oh, it's, a, it's a more wide than design pattern because design pattern maybe is just yeah, design pattern about the appearance uh, about the about the good good looking about about mm -hmm. the shape okay, about okay, okay. Uh, so this is a, all that all those kind of thing that you can look from you know on the surface you know Okay, like a mobile, like a, like a car. Right, know. exactly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry, thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack. Sorry, I have another question <laughs> from our, another of our guests, Mr. De Grande. Uh, I just sent a question in Italian. I will translate it for you in English. Uh, he asked exactly this uh, if, I have, if I had to invent a product and I would like to patent it, to make a patent in China. What should I do? It's a, it's a big question. But then you also asked, it is better to patent it in Italy and then extend it in the world, or is be it better to patent it first in China and then extend it in the world? What's your point of view? Okay, this is a very good question. I think for most uh, European countries, companies, um, I mean, for a foreign company, uh, you know, every company, they actually, they, ha they have a, they have a home country, right? For example, you are you are actually an Italian company. Italian company means that you have a the, the strongest research and development team that actually located in Italy. I don't know why or which city, but it must be outside China. That means once you have your creation finished and complete, should be firstly in your home country. Then of course, you need to file application, file a patent application in your home country. Then, because both Italy and China are actually member countries of a PCT, we call it, patent cooperation treaty country. So, so that we have a arrangement that to make make you as an Italian company that you can file your patent application in Italy, but within three years i i remember correctly it's not three years it's th three zero months then you can decide into which country that you want to obtain protection then you can do the we call it, enter into national stage of different countries so it means that if you don't have a research center in china then you should file applications in your country and uh, try to extend into China. But if you do have a research center in China or you do have a factory in China, you should care about filing applications in China first because China patent law requires that for any inventions, created in China shall firstly apply patent application in China. This is mandatory. So in, in world, if you don't have a research center in China, then you do patent application in your country and try to extend into China. If you do have a research and factory in China and you do have a, your creation complete in China, then you need to follow China's rules and uh, to do the compliance, you need to file application in China first. Okay, thank you, thank you. I, I, I hope uh, it is useful for, for you, Mr. De Grande, this uh, contribution. Uh, I don't know if uh, anybody else have uh, somebody, some, some other question, some other to ask. Okay, we have another question. Okay, I don't know if we still have Mr. Sung to ask this question because it's related to robotics. Uh, 
Ah, I'm sorry. Integratore di automazione. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Alessio, but I think Mr. Sung already left us because he left in advance. I'm, I'm sorry. We can ask question to Alessandro or Mr. Lee or uh, the Andrew Bay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Dispiace. Okay. Okay. C'è qualche altra domanda? Se no, terminiamo qui. If there is one, one last question, otherwise we can uh, close it here. It's already 11. Ok, Beh, se, okay. se non c'è nessun'altra domanda, niente, chiudiamo qua. Grazie ovviamente a tutti per, per la partecipazione. Come è stato detto, uh, vi manderemo a tutti del materiale, anche delle presentazioni che sono state fatte oggi, con i vari contatti. Poi ovviamente se avete domande, questioni, eh, cose da approfondire, noi, noi siamo qua, sia come Incred, sia come Sviluppo Cina. Ecco. Quindi non so se Stefano vuole dire due parole finali anche lui. Eh, no, tranne che, tranne che ringraziare tutti, Alberto, ovviamente per l'ottimo coordinamento e, e moderazione del, del webinar, ma ringraziare tutti per aver partecipato e soprattutto ricordare anche a chi non ha potuto avere la risposta perché Sung se l'aveva già andato, ma giustamente lo capisco, eh, abbiamo prolungato molto. Ma voglio dire, per qualunque domanda passata, futura, eccetera, rivolgetevi a noi, a Alberto o a me, eh, avete i nostri contatti, comunque ve li rimanderemo tutti, eh, teniamoci in contatto, seguiteci, faremo molti altri seminari, molti saranno focalizzati su diverse aree della Cina e su altri settori. Di, di rilievo, di importanza per, per gli scambi tra Italia e Cina. Quindi seguiteci, teniamoci in contatto e grazie ancora, direi che possiamo chiudere qui Alberto. Sì, sì, ok. So, thank you to all of you again and see you, see you next time. Arrivederci, bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, arrivederci. Bye bye.